Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to help you get the most out of your grappling ability and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to BJJ Brick Podcast. I'm Joe, and I'm here with my good buddies Byron and Gary. This is episode 371, The Art of War, Chapter 4, Tactical Dispositions. Uh, as usual, Byron has sent out a long list of scholarly show notes, which Gary and I have not reviewed. Guys, how you doing? I'm just reviewing the notes. There you go. <laughs> you too, buddy. <laughs> Awesome, Gary. Gary's on it today. And yeah, The Art of War, Chapter 4. This is the only chapter that rhymes. So I, I do appreciate that. Eventually, we're going to hit number four. And uh, I'm hoping one of you guys, or maybe the team of us, could make an off the mat lesson. Because I've heard some news that, that Gary had an encounter uh, with the canine variety. Oh, well, think- actually. I Two think it, it, in that encounter, Gary, would you say your worst mistake was pulling guard? You know, pulling guard left, uh, you know, my private areas open <laughs> and could have been really, really bad, especially going against dogs. It's already been um, shredded once before, so. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's not good. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> But yes, I did have a uh, a dog encounter. Um, I went out to visit my sister, and my sister has uh, a couple really large dogs. Uh, one's like a Irish Wolfhound. That's probably, I would say, maybe 130 pounds. And the other dog looks like a athletic, overweight Rhodesian Ridgeback. And I don't know what it is, but this dog's probably 140 pounds. And, uh, Gary, Gary, yeah, isn't that, the, isn't that the same line you used to uh, describe uh, jujitsu masters and seniors athletes earlier? <laughs> 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 yes, true. Um, <laughs> overweight was the key word. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> a- athletic is what I'm honing up. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, you know, I've known these dogs my whole life, but I only see them. Twice a year, maybe. And, How old uh, are these dogs? Um, I would <laughs> <Yeah>. say. <laughs> Not the one dog's in your story. Double <laughs> yeah, one dog's definitely double digits. Okay, okay. You know, You've known the their whole lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, their whole life. Not my whole life. Yeah, but uh, you know, as we pull in, um, you know, the dogs are waiting for me in the front yard and remember me and. They have never met my elderly dog who weighs like 35 pounds and can barely walk and can barely see, can't hear. Uh, And I should have realized when they attacked my elderly dog right off the bat, I could be in some trouble. Uh, Wait, wait. Back back up a sentence or two. Isn't that how you described the uh, Masters and Seniors athletes (laughs) earlier? No, that's how I was describing you and me, Joe. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, accurate. Yeah. yeah. You got that right. But so uh, uh, a little while later, uh, a couple hours later, they were fighting over food and they were going at it. Um, looked like they were, uh, you know, trying to kill each other. And I mean, they were, they reminded me of a National Geographic uh, video, um, you know, on the Sahara Plains, uh, animals going at it. But, you know, they, they were really going at it, really biting each other hard. And, uh, you know, I was afraid somebody was going to get hurt. And being the nice person I am, I decided to go over and break it up. As I tried to grab one dog, the other dog latched onto my arm. And uh, it wasn't good news. I've got four or five puncture holes in my arm. I was bleeding everywhere. And uh, here it is a week later, and I think it's got a little infection. Um, I noticed I've been frothing from the mouth. I don't know what that means. Um, But, you know, I was trying to tell Byron, I didn't know if I did the right thing, breaking it up, or or should I let it go? And, you know, we were trying to talk about what you would do in real life with that. Um, So I'm going to let Byron 
take over since he's a first responder and give his expertise of what we should do in that situation. Man, I don't I, <laughs> That's a bad situation. It's odd that are these these dogs are used to each other? Uh, they're used to each other, but they're pretty crazy dogs. So I would probably let it go. I, I, I don't know I don't know if I would have tried to break it up if my sister wasn't involved in it. Um, I guess I left that part out. I I was inside the living room and I look outside and I see these two dogs going at it on the patio on the on the deck and my sister was right there trying to hold one back. Ah. And it it kept getting worse. And the story you know, keeps getting sister, better or more crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And you know, a, after we got it all done, I noticed my sister was cut too, but I was bleeding was, like a stuck warthog. Your sister was she probably holding a baby. Was was the baby okay? She kept it. She kept the baby above her head. <laughs> so, so the dingo did not steal the baby. The dingo did not steal the baby. Uh, we're we're here talking about the art of war. <laughs> no, we have an optimate I mean, yeah. lesson here. Um, I mean, seriously, we're straight on the art of war right here. This is just a. It, I don't know. It, I would assume two dogs that know each other really well aren't going to fight to to the point of injury they've established. Uh, a sense they were going of, at it. Though. I know I, that's I terrible. I've seen dogs go at it like this. Yeah, I yeah, and it's I don't know what to do, Gary. You don't want to obviously get injured real bad, and it and I know your dog is not in in shape to fight with that sort of a. Uh, but my team my dog wasn't there. In at this on point. It, but it had gotten my a little dog, bit of it before. So yeah, so what I did is I found out they did not like my dog. I guess they don't like elderly dogs. So um, or any dog in the masters or seniors division. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I ended up taking my dog to the cabin and leaving my dog there. So uh, you know, I, I mean, if I, and I, I have run into this before. I'll, I'll tell you another story. Um, me and my boy are walking my dog at, at a park, which is kind of more of a uh, walking trails, uh, horse trails, um, running trails, mountain bike trails, kind of, you know, wooded single track. And we're back there. I'm walking my dog. And all of a sudden, we go around the corner. And these three dogs, probably, you know, 60-pound dogs. And, and at this point, my dog was probably 45, 50 pounds. This is, you know, as my dog gets older, my dog loses weight and and that kind of stuff. But we come around the corner, and three dogs had escaped from their three handlers. It was two middle-aged ladies and their little kid all, you know, had a had a dog on a leash. And, you know, I guess those dogs saw my dog or smelled my dog and just took off, and they could not hold him. And so all of a sudden, these three dogs start attacking my dog and me. And I just remember I'm in the middle of it, and I'm thinking of these YouTube videos I've seen where, <laughs> you know, guys get mauled. And, I mean, it was a mauling right off the bat. We we kind of, you know, we weren't prepared for war. We we didn't read The Art of War at that point. We, we were just on a leisurely stroll, and these three dogs, they came to fight, and we weren't ready, which is never smart. But... So those dogs are attacking my dog, and I just started throwing punches left and right, grabbing leashes and throwing dogs. And I bet I threw probably 10, 15 punches, grabbed the collar a couple times and throwing a dog, and it would go flying and then come right back. But what was really getting these dogs going was the the ladies and the kid were screaming bloody murder at the top of their lungs. And it was really riling these dogs up. And they weren't even trying to get to their dogs. They were more afraid, uh, you know, of what was going on and did not know how to react besides screaming at the top of the lungs. And I really thought I could be in some really bad shape on that one. But it felt like about five minutes, but I guarantee it was probably more like 30 seconds. But uh, after about 30 seconds, I think those dogs had enough. And, and these dogs were dogs I could handle a little bit more. You know, they, were, they weren't, they were you know, over 100 pounds. So I was just throwing punches left and right, throwing kicks. And uh, finally, I think they had enough, and they took off. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I ran around the corner as fast as I could, you know, tried to find a stick just in case those dogs came back, and then just checked my, myself and my dog for any type of injuries. And, uh, 
you know, on the way we went. Byron, I gotta tell you something. Okay. In the quest to be the baddest man on the BJJ Brit contest, our podcast, you know, we've all been striving for that. Gary just uh, took the title. I mean, when's the last time you won a street fight? against a couple of rabid dogs <laughs> throwing punches <laughs> grabbing collars I mean. <laughs> and I, I, it was weird because you you know it's something you don't train for i have no clue what i'm gonna do in that situation and to be honest i was worried about my dog you know i'm one of those guys that you know my dog is my family member um you know it's a it's a very special animal you know human person whatever you want to call it to me um you know so i was worried about my dog getting hurt more than i was worried about me i just wanted to make sure uh teddy my dog's name there came out of this okay gary where's the t-shirt around town that says touch my dog and your first jujitsu lesson is free <laughs> <laughs> so Gary, a couple things come to mind as we try to drag so this. i've been beat up twice by dog so. <laughs> oh man well it sounds rough um I think about this sometimes when I, uh, I'll jog with my dog and sometimes other people are also jogging with their dog, you know, and, and if they're my dogs, uh, I have two, only one of them is, is in running shape or condition. So you have two dogs. Yeah. Uh, cheese, our three legged dog has retired from, uh, distance running. She loves going on walks, but I'm not going to run her three or four miles anymore. That's, I mean, she's, she just doesn't enjoy it. And we don't want to wear her out, so we got a uh, another another dog in the adult division. <laughs> uh, but anyway, when when coming on the same pathway with somebody else, you know, it's like okay, their dog is freaking out, you know, and and my dog um, largely is able to ignore uh, things and and stay you know, fairly calm, but I always think what would happen if their dog got away from him? Because sometimes it looks like it probably could. What would I do? And so I don't really know what I would do, but I've thought about it enough to where I'd have an idea of a game plan. And one of our leashes, which I don't usually run with, uh, has a little pepper spray attachment. Uh, Now they say if if a dog is, um, aggressive enough to be, um, like really attacking you, it'll be able to ignore that. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's an option to kind of give it the old pepper spray. Um, the, my, my other thought is if this is really going bad, sometimes I run kind of near a fence and, and my dog is right around 50 pounds, huck him over the fence. <laughs> like not, it's not a tall fence, uh, under five feet and just pick him up and put him over the fence. Um, and then I'd have to jump after that. But the dog wants the other dog. They don't, want to attack me as a theory the other idea is if if this is getting serious like if it hasn't quite gone if I, I need to let my dog off of i need to let go of the leash so my dog could act in a way that he thinks is best for him whether it's roll over on his belly run like one time i was running with with my other with cheese my other dog and and she, another dog came approached her and she ran she ran all the way home she lost the other dog this is back when she had four legs and she ran about a half mile we were away from the house she went all the way home <laughs> Like, perfect. I yeah. just had to go home now. I didn't know for sure where she went, but she knows the neighborhood very well. So I think if, if I'm worried that we're going to get attacked, I need to let the dog off the leash or let go of the leash and let him make some decisions. I definitely don't want to, like, attach the leash to a tree or make him to where he is stuck there and then able to, uh, even a tight leash, he couldn't roll over on his belly or on his back to be submissive if he needs to. Um, I don't know. Um, and then uh, my other thought that I always have is how effective would it be like to grab the collar and then twist? Would that put a dog to sleep or, or are their necks thick enough to where that wouldn't work? Um, I don't know. And you'd have to probably step over the dog in order to get it, you know, tight and, and get it to uh, not be able to run away from the twist. I don't know, but that's, that's kind of a thought, but the idea of grabbing a, a a collar where the dog is trying to bite you sounds like a bad idea <laughs> in general. <laughs> I think kicks are probably more safer than punches because it just keeps your uh, torso, you know, higher off the ground. Maybe, it, you know, I'm not running in boots, but I have shoes on and, and maybe a quick kick and can change the dog's mind. Um, Joe, any other thoughts? Uh, I'll 
I'll defer to Gary. I mean, honestly, he's the only one that's won a street fight. He survived dogs, him. But, he's surviving. But, uh, you know, well, the, one thing, the one thing I would say, though, Byron, is the collar is the closest thing to the dog's most dangerous weapon, which that's is their true. mouth. That's the scary so, part. So if you do yeah. it correctly, that can, I think, be the place to grab. You know, you got to, uh, you know, how you. You know how you roll your knuckles up in your opponent's sleeve and then use your hand to direct the way their arm goes? Yeah. Maybe something like that. Maybe using two hands in conjunction, one on the collar, one on the top of the snout. But, I mean, think about it. Grab a dog by the tail. and, and look, well, I guess you can pick yeah. him up and spin him. That might be effective. Well, if the dog's but, a bit uh, smaller to pick up, you probably don't have to worry about it. I don't know. If you grab a... I've seen this on cops before. A guy grabbed the dog by the collar with both hands, and then he just leaned back and started spinning. Three sixty, uh, one hundred and fifty pound German Shepherd comes off up off the ground, and he just hugs it at the cops. <laughs> oh man! So, <laughs> I, I I'm sure in hindsight, now that we've heard all of Gary's tales, that was probably Gary in his <laughs> uh, in his rough uh, on the street days back when he was a teenager. You know, uh, Joe, you make a good point about the um, uh, grabbing the collar. And I, I think that was one of my mistakes. So I grabbed the collar one-handed. Um, this was on the the, sec- the first story I told. And the dogs were very close together. Uh, you know, they were kind of up on, on their hind legs. Their paws are connected, kind of like they're, you know, pummeling. And they're trying to, you know, attach their snout onto each other's neck or whatever. But as I grab the collar, I didn't grab it from totally behind. I was kind of in between them. So I kind of grabbed the side, which put my arm uh, right in harm's way where the dog just went forward. And, and I don't know if the dog was trying to bite me or just miss biting the neck. And, and when it was over and I asked the dog, you know, were you trying to bite me? I didn't get any answers, a uh, solid answer. So I, I wasn't totally sure if the dog was really attacking me. Well, you may have to face you again at some point in the future, and he doesn't want to give away any secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I would say an overall thought here is if you're going to be involved with a dog fight, you're probably going to get bloody. They're just... You say it's their best weapon. <laughs> what other weapon do they have? Like, they, like they're not going to kick you. <laughs> they're not going to, like, yeah, they're going to bite recommend? you like crazy. Would you recommend carrying a first aid kit everywhere you go? I for, no, or, for you, Gary, like, personally, while yes. You're walking? For you, yes, Gary, N- and nobody else though. But you seem to be. Also, guys, Gary has not revealed the fact that he. Runs around with a one of those uh, links of sausages all the time. Well, in his pants, well, it's a big link of sausage. <laughs> well, yeah, you could say that, but it's that's not accurate. But that's, I mean, <laughs> you could say that, but it'd be a lie. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right, guys, <laughs> that wraps up our our off the mat lesson. <laughs> And I don't know what lesson we got out of it. Don't but, fight uh, dogs. Don't. Uh, yeah. don't uh, but what do you do if the safe. dog attacks? Yeah, I, I think okay. it's positional related. Like, what about? Don't bring your dog. It, it, like you didn't know that, but but after that, you didn't bring your dog back. You were done with that, right? Yeah. And they yep. were attacking each other, which is nothing you could. I mean, that's just that's your sister's problem. Like, and you could help, but like that's really weird that that two dogs that live together would be in a fight that bad. That's weird. Food aggressive. Food aggressive. She she needs to probably feed them in yeah, different rooms, or feed them yeah. a full meal to where they're maybe they're they're starving. I imagine dogs that big eat a lot of food. Oh, they eat a lot of food. Yeah, they're not starving. Uh, Gary, t- at this point, for you personally, don't eat in front of those dogs. You're gonna get, you're gonna get them killed. <laughs> okay, I'll take <laughs> you that. You don't need to the heart. third attack, man. You only get to survive so many dog dog encounters, and you've already done it a few times. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say not not very many people have had two dog encounters. Next time yeah. we'll ask you about the time a cougar attacked you. I really think I think I won the first one, but I think I lost the second one. So I'd say I'm one and one and one in dog bites. Five hundred average in dog fights is pretty good, I think. But there's not, there's yeah. more than one dog at each fight, which is confusing as well. Did 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. The, I don't know how the math works out. But but I mean the second it was a human and a dog against three dogs, and the other one it was a human trying to break up two dogs. Gary, so I don't even know if the first one was a dog fight. You're being very humble just... and calling yourself a human, man. I, I mean, I've seen you <laughs> out there. And sometimes you're just amazing. <laughs> Why, thank you, Byron. Wolverine. Uh, Wolverine. All right. Hey, guys, let's talk about Chapter 4, Tactical Dispositions, The Art of War. And I've got this broken down into a couple of main ideas, and we're gonna, going to grab some things from other chapters as well but uh, we're not going to read the whole thing for you but uh, I'll, I'll jump to line 2 of chapter 4 and it's to secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands so if you get defeated or to secure yourself against the defeat that's up to you but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself or their selves and I think of this as like okay evaluate yourself have that evaluation, the evaluation of your opponent, and then look at those two different things and see where the opportunities are for a victory. Um, it's not just about how good is your game. It's partially it's like how good is your game against which your opponent is bringing. If you're a guard player and you're up against a substantially better guard passer than you are a player, it would, you're going to have to change it up a bit and maybe play a different type of guard or maybe try to get you know, put him in that position where he's now uh, playing guard, or maybe you avoid that altogether and you turn it into a takedown battle that the first two points wins, and that's all that happens. I don't know. But well, being able to compare your game and their game, but I guess I'm kind of getting a little off topic. Like, the ability to um, to not lose is in your hands, but the ability to find a place to win, you have to look at, the, at your opponent and see what they're giving up or what they're uh, weaknesses are. Does that make sense? You know, I think he's saying the same thing in both statements. He says, to secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands. In other words, we're in complete control of whether or not we lose. If we lose, it's because we made some sort of a bad tactical decision or we made a mistake. But then he turns around and says, the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy. In other words, it's the it's exact same thing. We're probably not going to win this unless he makes a mistake or a, some sort of an error and we capitalize on it. So I think, you know, when this comes to jujitsu, uh, we're, we're responsible for both winning and losing. But it's, um, especially if you're a competitor today, the, the bra- brackets are tight and the difference in skill level between two opponents is almost non-existent. You know, you have two very equally uh, skilled opponents and the victory is often going to come down to which guy makes the first mistake. I like that, Joe. And, uh, you know, you talk about the second part of that, the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy itself. And here uh, three weeks ago, I went to visit my in-laws. Um, they just moved to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and I'd never been there before. So, uh, you know, the second day I was there, I decided to go check out uh, the battlefield. And my son was really into it. He knows everything about Gettysburg, did a bunch of research. You know, he learned about it in school and then knew we were going there. So he was reading about the battle forever. But, you know, I, I think about that uh, battle right there and – You know, just a couple places I went in Gettysburg and, you know, hearing about it. Can you hear me, Byron? Yeah. I was trying to get my my dog's been kind of barking, so I've been trying to get her to be quiet. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I'm excited that your son is interested in history and and doing that well. Keep going, Gary. Yeah. Yeah, no, wait, real quick. Real quick. That was my first thought, too. It's what a good kid, man. Yeah. Well, you'll love this story. Like, he... He when he gets on to something, he studies it like crazy. But uh, I remember he told us uh, before we got there, he's like, hey, there's no need to get a tour guide. He's like, I know everything about it. And <laughs> to be honest, we did not get a tour, tour guide. He, he knew all the different all the different spots. But um, kind of going back to that story about the enemy defeating itself, just a couple places we visited one. And I, many people have probably heard about Pickett's Charge. Uh, where they charged up Seminary Hill. But, you know, I'm just looking at this hill, and 
you know, the north is up top and the south is coming from the bottom and there's really no trees and, you know, they have cannons up top shooting grape shot. And I, I just imagine them imagine in there. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me that people would charge up this hill at a well-armed enemy. And, you know, it was a, uh, it was a disaster. And then there's a, there's another part, uh, a couple miles down the road, uh, called little, little big top, little round top. And it's a, it's a little mountain, uh, hill. I don't know what you want to call it with rocks everywhere, which gives you good hiding spots up top and no trees. Uh, there were trees on the backside, but not on the front side. So the same thing, the, the South was, you know, the, the North had the, the high ground South was on the other side and, you know, is like shooting ducks, uh, you know, no camouflage, just wide open targets. And I just remember I was like trying to take that hill had to be brutal, you know, it just seemed like a, not a very smart move. And, and I could imagine, you know, being, you know, one of those Confederates trying to being told to go up that mountain and take it. And you're just looking at it and you're like, well, here's the end of my life going up there. It's uh, seemed like a really tough task uh, to do. Man, what a, what a trip that, uh, or a little uh, part of your vacation. And it, it sounded like you had one of the yeah. best tour guides out there. Yeah, I would recommend anybody who's out that way and, you know, like history or whatever to, to stop by. I, I really enjoyed it. I was there for probably the whole day, and I actually thought about coming back another day um, just because there's so much there. But it's a really nice place to visit. So so you mean stop by there, not your house, because I thought if I was interested in history, I'd just stop by and talk to you for a while. <laughs> I mean Gettysburg, yeah. Okay. If you stop by my house, please don't bring a dog. <laughs> All right. Guys, uh, I, I like this because it's bringing kind of a – battlefield of of thought into the art of war here which is kind of the where it's the heart of it is um but we're, we're in chapter four i'm going to jump to chapter six and grab a line out of there that's related to the, the the these tactics and modifying your tactics do not repeat this is chapter six line 28 do not repeat the tactics which have gained you one victory but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. So you go out there and you win a certain way. Don't think that's the only way you could win. You need to, yet again, be able to evaluate your opponent. And we're doing this a lot of times live. Like, yeah, you could, some people are able to go out and research opponents and figure out what they're good at and and adjust accordingly. But most grapplers, you know, are going out there, shaking hands with somebody they've never met before, and, and the match starts. And you've got a few minutes, really, to figure out a, a part of their game that you could capitalize on. And uh, it, it, that's really that's, – that's an impressive thing to, to accomplish, to to meet somebody and figure them out, find the hole in their game, and exploit it, tap them out. That's crazy. Um, if you think of an actual tournament, you're going to face several different types of players. Like, you could be – you could have your game plan – but how does it match up against a top level wrestler? How does it match up against somebody who pulls guard and they're playing the type of lapel guard, or uh, somebody who you know pulls half guard on you or puts you in your half guard right away? Like there are so many varieties of game that you have to encounter and either put back in your game or adjust yours to fit theirs. It's it's pretty difficult, <laughs> not just statistically, but it's an impressive feat to win a tournament uh, because of the variety of opponents you're facing. If all your opponents were the same, you could, you could adjust accordingly, you know, in training and then you'd be good to go. Um, back at, back in the day, I think I was a blue purple belt. Maybe, uh, I did a tournament up in, uh, Topeka, Kansas. Um, th- there weren't a lot of tournaments like there are now. <laughs> so it was, it was like my annual outing for a tournament, you know, and a road trip with the, with the team and, and between um, the my weight class and the in the absolute division, I had racked up several wins, all by pulling guard 
and getting a loop choke rather quickly from what I remember. This is years ago, but from what I remember, it was, it was pretty much the same thing. I pull guard, I grab their collar, and, and then, you know, once they break posture a little bit or whatever, I got my loop choke, and it was like, it was pretty fun. Loop choke after loop choke after loop choke. And everybody started to kind of key out on this until I get to the absolute division. And, and then the last guy who also cleared out his division and uh, we start the match and he pulls guard. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> Whatever was working for me then is it going to work now. Cause I can't do my move because I'm on top and I did lose that match. I don't know how, I don't remember that at all, but um, it's just like, yeah, that looking back, he did the, the perfect thing of he just took away my best move. And he didn't know that was my best move, but it was definitely the move that was showcased the most and it would it was like a brick, you know, like I was I was hitting it a lot. And uh he figured out, hey, I could just avoid this by pulling guard first. <laughs> so that's my example of not adjusting my tactics uh based on what was in front of me. Hey Byron, I didn't know they had absolute in the kids division. Oh yeah. They call it the big kids division. <laughs> I was going to say, you cleaned out the big kids division. <laughs> but we all get, we all have our favorite techniques. But if, if you're trying that and it's failed once, it's failed twice, you know, look for that opportunity to maybe do something a little different. You know, what do you do when your teammates that the techniques don't work on? What are your, your plan B and C that might work? That's kind of what I think on that one. Yeah, I was thinking this is a good thing for people to consider and evaluate if they feel that their jiu-jitsu has hit a plateau. You know, after years and years of reading articles on the Internet about jiu-jitsu, uh, reader, or listeners' comments on the uh, brick, you see over and over where the, the story is kind of similar. You know, I, I came in, I, I did jiu-jitsu for a couple of months, you know, and I, and I found a game that was working, and now it just doesn't seem to work anymore. You know, so what am I doing wrong or what's the problem? And the reality is you're just in a little pond with all the same fish. And if the thing you stumbled upon that, upon that worked real well for you was, you know, take down to top side control and then submit from there or pass and submit from side control, um, your, your teammates start to figure it out. It's not that your game is not good anymore. You're just doing the same thing over and over and over, and it becomes easy for people to defend. Yeah, which in so, in turn will make your offense have to adjust and get better. But yeah, it is frustrating to hit that kind of a stall, and and uh, your opponent, your training partners have figured you out. <laughs> yeah, but you know you're talking about it's frustrating, and man, I just wish everybody. I, I used to get in that point, and I would get frustrated. And, you know, I know there was times I thought maybe this sport isn't for me early in the career, but I love it. I, I mean, I absolutely love it when something like that happens now. I just, it makes me adapt my game. It makes me figure out a new way to get to that point. Uh, you know, it makes me figure out how to defeat my opponent who has now defeated me. It's it, For me, it's just so fun. I'm trying to figure out new ways. It's, it's like a brand new puzzle. Uh, I can think back to my mom. She just loved to do crossword puzzles. And I'd go down to the bookstore and get her a New York Times crossword puzzle book and you know, I'd drop it on the table and she would just run at that thing like you wouldn't believe, you know, having so much fun. And I, I just love trying to figure stuff out and it just makes my game that much better. I, I have to evolve. I can't just stay stagnant. And uh, it's it's so it's so rewarding when you do figure it out. And, you know, it's a it's a blend of, you know, using your body and mind. Uh, that's what I love about this sport so much. Your mind comes into play a lot. So what you're saying is when somebody appears to have figured out your Achilles heel or figured out a guaranteed way to win you, you get excited like, hey, they just gave me a brand new opportunity. Yes, sir. And, yeah, uh, you, you just you just won the Internet. Yeah. It's, I, I, I used to not think like that. And for some reason, I all of a sudden changed. And it, I, I can say a lot of it is rolling with Byron. Um, me and Byron have rolled forever, and we don't roll that much together anymore. But – we were always kind of about the same skill level and, and one of us would get figure something out and just dominate for a little while. Then one of us would figure that out and dominate for a little while. And we just kept going back and forth uh, for years. And 
that was that's when I really it, it was just neat. It really progressed my game, and I don't think I would progress as as much if somebody didn't shut that down. If my turning partners didn't, you know, they see the same thing every day and they figure it out, figure out a way to shut down. And uh, but for me, yeah. it's a it's a great learning experience. That that same example. Uh, Gary is. I'm working on my uh, body lock pass, and it's going. It's going pretty good. I'm not. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm proficient at it yet, but I, I. I'm enjoying the process of getting it, and I. I'm trying to take my time and and to do the pass correctly, and 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 to really you know kind of control that part of the the session. But that being said, usually Gary will sweep me when I attempt it on him, and. He's he's he has swept me more than anybody in that process, and he's yeah. probably swept me more than everybody else combined. Like I, I like he has something, and, and we talked about what he's doing, but nobody else is doing this like he is. And like Eric but said, see, we don't roll a ton together, but he's definitely got the key to, yeah. to this problem. <laughs> see, that's what it is. It's perfect because you're rolling with your training partners all the time, and and they they know what you're doing, they see what you're doing. And me, I'm a different style, and we don't roll together that much anymore. So, you know, not only are you seeing your regular people, then you're you're branching outside of your regular school and rolling with me and seeing different stuff. But for me, my training partners don't really use the body lock pass, and I'm not a body lock pass person. Um, so it's great. So all of a sudden, I see stuff that I don't get to see, too. Like so an easy sweep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's definitely not true. But uh, um, but I, I know, you know, you're thinking about it. I know when we rolled, what was it, last week a little bit, you uh, – or was it last week? I don't know when. But I know we talked about stuff like that afterwards, so I know it's going through your head. It's it's going through my head. Um, you know, I got a training partner who's been picking your brain a little bit. To, to He wants to get better at body lock passing. And like I told him, he was asking me about body lock passing. I was like – I'm the last guy to talk to. I'm not a, that's not my game, but we, we have to try stuff. We're, we're going to get shut down and then you just have to re-engineer it, figure out what this person's doing. Is there a way I can shut it down? And, and you know, then all of a sudden you start passing me left and right. And then I'm going to have to be like, okay, what's he doing now? And what can I do to, you know, even this out? Yeah. And, but definitely I'm not going to, not try the body like passing you because I I do know next time I try it I'll probably not succeed but it's definitely like that's not the process that I'm that's that's not what I'm doing I'm trying to get better at it and yeah. so doing it yeah. to you is the perfect opportunity for me to adjust or to talk yeah. a- afterwards and see what happened yeah yeah and isn't it so rewarding you know you're trying so hard you're trying so hard I can't pass Byron's guard you know for a month. And we talk about it, and I work on a little bit of stuff, and all of a sudden I'm in his guard, and, and I get a pass, even though I probably get swept back real quick. But it's just rewarding. It just uh, – those are the little things that keep you going. I know a lot of people talk about stripes and the next belt, um, and, you know, nothing wrong with that at all. Those keep you going. But for me, it's the little victories. and. I will call it a victory, even though we're rolling uh, in the gym. But just little things like that where I'm learning. Uh, for me, every time I learn something new, that's a little victory for me. Yeah. Guys, let's let's make a little bit of a move here um, from the first kind of main topic of modifying your tactics. And, and then in this chapter, he talks about uh, defense versus attacking and standing on defense. So, lo- chapter four, line six. I kind of feel like I'm I'm doing a thing out of a Bible, like you know, uh, you guys. Everybody turn to Luke, and then they say the chapter in the. <laughs> anyway, uh, line six, standing on the defense indicates insufficient strength. So, if you're being defensive, your strength is probably not sufficient. Attacking indicates a super abundance of strength, and we're clearly not just talking. Not even Sun Tzu, like strength wise, but but like, what's the strength of your position? What's the strength of the situation? It could be based on skill, it could be based on you know cardio or the actual strength or mental 
uh, advantage or some other, it could be something I'm not even popping into my head right now, but like some significant advantage is the strength we're talking about. So if you're needing to be particularly defensive, you, like you've lost that category. Like skill is the easiest one to think of, even more than strength. If if you are rolling with somebody who is, you know, substantially higher skill level than you are, you're probably playing defense most most of the time. And even if like, I remember rolling, you know, with, you know, like Jason Bircher back, you know, back in the day. It's like, if I'm going to try to survive this five minute round, I don't get to attack at all. Like I, I will be defending solidly, but as soon as I attack, I open up and, and same thing with Gary. A lot of times, like if, when I try to attack Gary, I can submit, <laughs> try to hold him back a little bit and it's not so bad. Like it's, it's just being more defensive as far as, um, being a little bit insufficient in some categories, so you have to you have to build the defense. And you think of it like it takes less force to defend a position in in war than it does to attack a position. So if you're if someone's got a you know a wall built or a castle and and they've dug in that sort of thing, it takes less of a force to do that than it does to actually attack those fortified positions. You guys have any thoughts on on the? I think it's 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 fairly true as far as with jiu-jitsu. If, if you are unequipped to deal with the person in front of you, you're going to be more defensive, and and that will potentially let you last longer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, w- I would agree, but I think there's sort of a fine line between uh, um, being defensive and maybe being a counterpuncher kind of thing, you know. Uh, raw, raw aggression aggression from one side or the other doesn't necessarily tell you who's more equipped to win the battle. Yeah. So, so sometimes you have people that play sort of a a defensive game, but sometimes they're good enough that you think you're in control of the action, but really they are. And they're just um, leading you down a path that's going to lead to a mistake and they're going to capitalize. Yeah. I, I've been tricked by my coach before. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't? You, you know, you think you're on offense. The next thing you know, you're being triangled or something. So, um, and it seems kind of like if, if you if you are rolling with your coach, who is going to tap you out? Like that's what they're wanting to do. Um, if you if you if you are just more defensive, you have a, a better chance at not getting tapped out, or maybe adding a minute or two to that. Now, it's not great jujitsu. It's not necessarily even good learning for you, although it's important to learn how to be defensive. Uh, but if if the goal is to not get submitted, um, to go on attack is is a bit risky. I mean, you could also win that. You could you know be in a tournament and just know that you can't deal with this guy and you happen to get a standing guillotine and you get the win. <laughs> like, that's cool. But, but see, that, that that's how my coach wins. Is he gives me the impression for a minute that things are sort of equalized a little bit, and if I just get a little more aggressive, I'm going to be able to get this pass or or lock this submission up. And um, he he kind of goes into the defensive mode, but it but I'm not the one in control. It, it might appear that way. Like if my wife is watching, she might see uh, portions of a, a round where I'm rolling with my coach and think that I'm in control. I'm forcing him to defend, but he's actually leading me down a path that's going to uh, uh, end up with him countering something and submitting me. Yeah, but but how does he need to do that, or could he just lead you? He down doesn't this need. He, yeah, he, he can. <laughs> he doesn't necessarily need to. Yeah, that that's the thing is, um, it, it can look one way, but actually be another. Sometimes uh, people, I, people I, think jujitsu don't be like that, but it do. I play a pretty. Um, open style of, of grappling a lot of times with my training partners and and, and somebody will have mount on me and and it will be 30 seconds left in the round and I'll think well can I submit them within this 30 seconds and then it's going to be a lot of work I've got several things to do besides escaping mount but that's a fun challenge sometimes it's like if I have to be super offensive and I, and I realize that from this position even attempting to submit them, like obviously not from bottom mount, but to to escape and add a submission onto that is is a high risk situation. But it's really fun to just so. <laughs> we can look at this in the reverse, where 
the ability to successfully attack somebody is often the result of a dominant position and achieved by that super abundance of strength, you know, and you can substitute strength for any other thing like skill, speed, timing, knowledge, whatever. Like that's when you have the ability to attack or attack at will um, when you've got a big gap in a category or two. I've always had trouble with the guys who just attack, attack, attack. Um, I I think I'm getting better and, you know, I'm happy with my game. And then all of a sudden I start rolling with somebody who attacks first, but just attacks, attacks, attacks. I may get out, but while I'm getting out, he's already a plan in that second attack. I escape that. That third attack's coming. And when I'm always playing defense and just uh, – I'm a step behind or, or that person gets the attack first. And that's kind of why I like that uh, line and chapter that you were talking about. Cause that's always been uh, my Achilles heel. The, the guy who just attacks, attacks, attacks. So Sun Tzu in this same chapter, moving kind of to the next thing is uh, like looking at the clever fighter is what, is what Sun Tzu says. And uh, line 11 now, what the agents call a clever fighter is one who only who not only wins but excels at winning with ease. And this is, I mean, this is not really jujitsu stuff, but like, you know, you know, clearly, if you are in the in the purple belt division and you should be a black belt, or you're in the white belt division and you should be a really you're a really good blue belt, you know, like okay, that's winning with ease. But that's not what we're advocating here. Um, it's finding a way to win that that looks easy. <laughs> and well, Byron, I would talk about Gordon Ryan on this. Uh, you think about as high level as these grapplers are that Gordon Ryan's going against. You know, I know his last couple matches, uh, he would put an envelope at the scorers table with the submission that he was going to win, and okay. then after he won. They would open it up, and that's what he won by. Like, that guy is so good against guys who are incredible. You know, he can throw that out there. Like, I couldn't imagine going against you in, in a tournament and and being so confident that I could submit you with a specific move that I'm going to put it in an envelope and, you know, give it to the uh, the announcer. So but I have a couple of thoughts on that. He's the clever guy. <laughs> he is that good. He's he he can write down his move and make it work. But he like that takes time to get to to happen. And, and it takes time to get it to happen, but like when he's been doing it, everybody knows he's working his his back attack to that little uh, reverse triangle. Um so you know even though you don't know what he's wrote, written down, you probably have a real good idea what it is, and you've probably, going up to this tournament, worked on it. And we're talking two very skilled guys, and he's still getting to that position and getting it. That's what really impresses me. But his, I think that's just the, the talking about the skill gap there. He's not gonna. He's not gonna write down how he's gonna be Andre Galvo on an envelope. Yeah, I, I bet he would. Do you think so? I mean, that guy is that confident. And, uh, but but I, why would I, he not just put the best move possible? And then, so I think w- what I'm seeing in some of these matches, and I haven't watched all of them, but he's he's not doing some things that he could do. So, like, if he writes down triangle choke and he has my back, he could finish me with the rear naked choke if he wants. He could arm robbing me from there if he wants. But, but still, he's, he's, he's so he's confident. A, he's so confident a loss will really hurt his, his income. And when you pass up that heel hook that you could have had in a minute and it would have been a guaranteed win, and now all of a sudden, you know, you've drugged this thing out to seven or eight minutes. Like, I don't know. I yeah. just, I don't think he's me, afraid that's, of losing because I don't think he, that's even in his mind. I think he's he, the type I, of guy not that, in his mind. But, but if he does lose, you know, that's less money for him down the, down the path, down the, you know, down the road. He's, yeah. Uh, you know he's he's kind of a legend. Well, he is a legend. Yeah, I just think that the the, the people who he's fighting, he knows he could beat him with like any number of of techniques that he has that are of that level. And as long as like the envelope is sealed, that's not that's not a bug. That's a feature that helps him because if he were to say I'm triangling you, 
that's an advantage for his opponent to know that that's what's in the envelope. You know what I mean? The fact that it's a secret <laughs> is a benefit <laughs> to get that technique done. If he called it on on I don't know what Instagram a day before and said I will triangle this person or I will footlock this person like you could say that that's probably what he did earlier on when he was a leg lock guy. Everybody knew he was going to leg lock him. But when he came to ADCC this last time, he wasn't a leg lock guy anymore. He had he that's and that's why I would say he's a clever fighter. He adjusted his game and 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 fought people away differently than they expected. And I would expect the next major tournament that he's in, he's a different fighter than he was the last time. And uh and that's that that's really hard to fight that person. Yeah. I mean, he's a clever fighter 2.0. 2.0. He'll get to 3.0 one of these days when you help him out, Gary. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can really help him out. <laughs> so, I, I I don't know. It's just that the... Um, I mean, if Gordon Ryan, to make an extreme example, were to fight any of us three, or all of us three, whatever, he could write down anything <laughs> he wants on the envelope, right? Like, it's, it's, it doesn't well, matter. He, what he would do is I think he would have 10 envelopes and what you what the announcer would do is put him in a different order, and he would have to figure out what submission he has to take every ten seconds against us. Yeah, what I would do if, is to tap to something that's not actually a submission and make his envelope invalid. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I see, I that was a clever one. It. That's a clever fighter. <laughs> Sun Tzu also talks about making no mistakes. Uh, this will be in line. Uh, let's see, line 12. He, he's talking about the clever fighter and that he wins his battles by making no mistakes. And and this isn't just on the mats, you know, or on the battlefield. We're talking about making mistakes in training, in your game plan, in the competition, in your diet, whatever. Like, so it might be a mistake for Sun Tzu to bring a certain type of uh, – you know, armor to the battlefield or a certain type of, uh, you know, a broadsword instead of a, I don't know, a spear or whatever. Like, that's the mistake right there. The, the battle unfolds and strategically was laid out how the best he could, but that was a mistake. That's, I mean, so making no mistakes in your game plan uh, in, in any of the categories. And that's really hard to do. And, and usually we're going to have some mistakes, but um, jumping down the line 14. The skillful fighter. Yeah. I, I want to go back to what you said, and I really liked what you said, you know, because mistakes. And I'm like, well, people are going to make mistakes. It, it happens, and, and your opponents will force you into mistakes. But I, I liked how you brought in you're not just talking about on the battlefield or on the mat. You're talking about in practice. And, um, okay, cue the Iverson. Practice. We talking about practice, but, you know, I say that every time. But I love the – where you talked about practice because we're going to put ourselves in those situations. We're going to, you know, stress ourselves in practice so that when we get out there, there's a less chance of mistake. Uh, you know, I'm going to take your firefighting and I'm going to take what Joe does for a living. Uh, you know, you guys are always going, you guys are practicing scenarios, uh, worst case scenarios. And so when it does happen, you're more prepared you know, when it happens on the battlefield, when it happens on the mat and you and a less of a chance, you're going to make that mistake. And and I can even go back to, you know, my two dog attacks uh, that I've ran through. I personally think. Customize and save. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm going to go back to uh, talking about, uh, you know, my my two dog fights that I really think jujitsu practice and being cooked to the bone, being put in uncomfortable positions made me more comfortable in those positions where I was talking about the, the one family just screamed at the top of their lungs and didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to react. And I think practice, you know, working at, you know, working hard in practice will prevent those mistakes. You know, you'll still have mistakes sometimes, but it'll lessen your chance of a mistake. Yeah. Or a critical mistake. A critical mistake. Yeah. Good point. But uh, let me hit line 12 here. 
Um, actually, I'm going to skip line 14. Hence, the skillful skillful fighter puts himself in a position which he, it was just impossible to be defeated, and does not miss the opportunity uh, for defeating the enemy. So, like you have to have good defense. You have to be. I think that's what you mentioned, Gordon Ryan. He doesn't think he's going to lose. He does. He couldn't. You know, hop on his back. He's still going to win. Like that's that's where he's at with his defense. You're not submitting him. And then he's able to write down a submission and do it and apply that because, you know, whether this match happens in 30 seconds or, or 15 minutes, he's confident that he's going to figure out a submission out and, and get it, and find it on you. So um, imp- make defeat impossible first and then find that place to win. Uh, you know, uh, our buddy that we've had on the show, Roy Marsh, a couple times, he posted something on Facebook the other day, and uh, I was just looking it up right now. Uh, his little quote, this is my entire philosophy, and yet it's so alien to so many people. And what he, he just posted a quote from a guy named Aaron LaPointe, and Aaron said, words of wisdom from Carlson, Black Belt, Mario Sperry. No matter what happens... I'm happy to be on top. When I'm on top, my goal is not to pass his guard. It's not to submit him. It's not to get my position. Nothing like that. What I want is to make him tired. And, you know, when you're on top and you're smashing, it's really tough to be defeated in that spot. Um, you know, you got that. We've always rolled with a guy who's got that really tough top game, and he's just making me tired. He's making it harder for me to escape. And uh, it's there's not very many submissions, you know, when you're fully mounted. Um, so, uh, I I thought that quote went kind of good with, uh, what we were just talking about. Gary, I think that's awesome. So we're talking about the skillful fighter and, uh, just have a kind of a closing thought here is that it's, it's ridiculous to just be, like better than everyone all the time. Yeah, I'm going to be better than them. I'm going to be stronger, faster, more skilled, you know, more knowledge, experience, whatever. Like that's not real. <laughs> that's why we have that's why we do jiu-jitsu because it is hard. We're going to have some losses. We're going to have some things go not our way. But I was also to say that the skillful fighter will take a loss and turn it into an advantage long term. They will learn from the tough lessons. True. It's obviously different in the art of war when they're actually going to war and, like, no defeat is, is acceptable. You know, if you're going to have 10 battles, any one of those, if you lose it, you die. Like, um, okay, you can't w- lose any of these 10 battles. But if you um, are wanting to get better at jiu and you're wanting to compete a lot and you have a match that would be a tough match and you say, hey, you know, I'm probably going to lose this. I'll, I'll pass on this one today. Um, go out there <laughs> as long as you don't get injured and and get that experience and get that lesson and you know in 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 a month or a year or five years that match will have adjusted jujitsu in a positive way hopefully so i would say the skillful fighter learns from both victory and defeat so that kind of yeah um yeah gary let's hear it i was just gonna say i think it kind of goes back uh You know, I don't necessarily like to say defeat in training, um, but this kind of goes back to what we were talking about. Uh, I've been sweeping you left and right, and then you figure it out, and the rest of the training partners figure it out, and then uh, I have to learn from that and get better at that position. And, you know, it's just so cool when your whole team is like that, and we're all just pushing each other to get better. And then when it does time, time to step on that battlefield you know we're a little bit better than we were last time we've we've trained all sorts of positions where when that stress comes we're gonna make we there's a less chance for us to make that as byron said that critical mistake joe he's talking about sweeping me left to right that's not accurate it's basically always to the right (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've been watching point. it, and it's uh, I got some I got some work to do, my friend. Well, perfect because I love it that you said that, 
I'm going to sweep the other way now. Write it in an envelope and, and then hand it to, to Mike <laughs> and let's see if it happens. <laughs> That's what we should do. I love it. <laughs> well, hey, Joe, hey, did we lose you there for a little bit? Is that when you came back on? Did, did we lose you? Am I here now? You're here now. I know you're here now, but All did right. we lose you a little while ago? I might have. You know, okay. it's a stormy day in Texas, but. So, <laughs> I wanted to give a quick uh, mention of the BJJ Brick Quick. You guys, if you haven't heard a quick episode, it only takes a few minutes. <laughs> and uh, I think, I think Joe said. has yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joe has a few episodes he's gonna he's gonna make, and and we'll see if Gary has any interest in doing that. Um, it's it's five or six minutes. That's what she said of. Um, just talk oh. about jujitsu and uh, pick a topic. And, and so, Gary, what's up? Hey, I just looked up the definition of quick. It's an adjective, <laughs> moving fast or doing something in a short time. Um, so, I just thought I would. It's a, say it's that. all if perspective. We're using it as, a, as an adverb, at a fast rate, quickly. Oh. And as a noun, I don't think anybody knew this. The soft, tender flesh below the growing part of the fingernail or toenail. That's your quick. I did not know that. Yeah. So when you cut your dog's nail back to dogs, you don't want to cut it I'm not into going, the quick. I, Byron, every time you talk about dogs, I start foaming at the mouth. So uh, <laughs> please stop. But if you cut your dog's nail and it, and, they, and it hurts them, you have cut into the quick, and that's way too far. So be. Oh, is that what that's called? Yeah. Okay. So. Anyways, to to end on a dynamite topic like quick. But uh, Gary, <laughs> record a quick episode. To, uh, send it to me, and I'll. Send I've been it meaning to. The... <laughs> I've been meaning to record one. I've just been. Uh, I've been extremely busy here. I know you have. I'm just giving you a hard time. Yeah. But, uh, no, I'm gonna. I will get one out. But it's really kind of fun to sit down and record half a dozen little things. That, you know, just I, I put my phone on a little timer and I hit go and. And when it hits about four and a half or five, I start trying to wrap it up. But sometimes I haven't got close to wrapping it up. And and uh, and then I pause a second and then record another one and back to back. And, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a little fun experience. And, and we'll see if we keep cranking these out. I say we, but I know Joe's got a couple on the way. <laughs> <laughs> we as in the podcast uh, team. Well, guys, anything else we're going to need to add? Any major news with you guys? No. Taking some dead air as a negative, which is good. All right. Yeah. Um, Till next time, stay sweaty, my friends. And stay away from dog fights. Uh, train hard, train smart. Wait, wait a minute. Don't forget to shower. If you don't smell like uh, can of old beef... <laughs> The dogs, <laughs> dogs, dogs aren't coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> no beefaroni in your pocket. Uh, there you go. All right, guys, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You can visit our website at bjjbrick.com. For more good times, swing by and like our Facebook page. Our email is bjjbrick at gmail.com.